to U.S. Farm Report. These programs are brought to you in the hope of building a better understanding of the problems facing the farmers of this country and how these problems affect all other segments of this great nation. Today we have with us, discussing some of these issues, National Farmers Organization President Oren Lee Staley and Organizational Director Lloyd Fairbanks. The members of the NFO in this area are happy to bring this program to the listening audience. These programs are brought to the listening audience through the efforts of the NFO members in this area. They have donated their time, they have donated their money in order to make this program possible. In order to inform the public about the progress of the NFO, the aims and objectives, these programs uh, feature many of the department heads in the NFO. You know, it takes more than one individual or more than a few people to make the success of an organization a reality. And so consequently, the NFO has made more progress than any other organization in all the history of agriculture. The growth of the NFO has been fast, covering a broad area. This has taken the work of many people, many people that have been willing to make the sacrifice of leaving their farms and their communities to go into other areas and talk to farmers about their business problems. And so now, after just a little over seven years, Everyone is recognizing that the NFO has the experience in bargaining, has brought into agriculture a new era. Because when we first started organizing our collective bargaining program, very few people thought it was practical, very few people thought it would work, and certainly no one was talking about bargaining for, for agriculture. But because of the growth of the NFO, because of the understanding that the NFO has brought to farmers about the necessity of bargaining, it now is a reality. And by being a reality, I mean that almost everyone is talking about farmers needing bargaining power, but the NFO has established bargaining power for the American farmer, really for the first time. Never before have farmers been able to bargain over a broad area. Never before has there been nationwide bargaining ag in agriculture on the major commodities in this great agricultural area of the Midwest and the areas on outlying and joining the, the Midwestern agricultural producing area. I have with me today Lloyd Fairbanks, who is director of the organizational department. And farmers must organize first in order to be effective in bargaining. They cannot and they have not been able to solve their problems and then organize. It's necessary for them to organize and solve their problems. And in order to do this, it has taken the work of many people. It has taken the work and the efforts of many people, and of course it takes somebody directing the total efforts of all the people. The NFO has many qualified department heads. These department heads that make up the NFO are all farmers because only farmers can be members of the NFO. But in agriculture, you have many people that had experience in other fields. You've had many people that have ed excellent educational background in agriculture, that have had experience in other business fields and in almost every walk of life in America. And many of those have returned back to the farm and have come back after this experience because they wanted to go back to living in the rural communities. These people that have had experience in the rest of the business world, these people that have seen what the rest of the economy is really doing and what makes it click, have been some of the most dynamic leaders in the NFO. And now with the fact that they've had the experience in other fields, the fact that they have experienced what the rest of the economy is doing, it has made a dynamic organization out of the NFO. And not only has it made a dynamic organization out of the NFO, with people experienced in other fields working to bring into agriculture their experience in those fields, but also they have made it possible for many of the farmers to rally around this type of leadership in the NFO. This leadership exists at the county level, at the district level, and at the state level and at the national level. 
I'm very proud today to have with me a man who has been with the organization since almost its inception because he has had some experience in other fields, because he has a desire to see agriculture have stability in the industry, and because he has this desire and experience, he has been willing to give his time. He has been willing to give all the effort and energy that he could muster to lead the most important phase of a collective bargaining program, and that phase is to organize. Because individual farmers, operating as individual farmers, trying to market their products as individual farmers, one here, one there, one today, one tomorrow, in each small area of each county, it meant that these farmers, individual farmers, selling to large buyers, buyers that are getting smaller in number, and buyers that are getting more powerful economically, that it was necessary to bring these individual farmers into an organization that could be large enough and powerful enough to meet the buyers of farm commodities on an equal level. And so today I would like to introduce to the listening audience Lloyd Fairbanks, the National Organizational Director. Lloyd, I think you might tell them first your age, and uh, uh, I think this is always important to uh, know something of the background of the people that head the various departments. Huh? Lloyd, how old are you now? Only I'm 44, <clears throat> coming up on 45. Well, time slips by before you know it, uh, because I know that it uh, doesn't seem too long because of the busy uh, life you've had uh, through, uh, even though you're not old in years, you've had a lot of miles because you've covered a lot of territory. Uh, you've had a lot of experience. Uh, Lloyd, uh, tell me, uh, of course, you were a uh, World War II veteran. What did you do in the World War II? Only I flew a B-24 uh, bomber uh, in uh, uh, Guam, Okinawa, in the Pacific area. Well, of course, that meant a lot of training, uh, meant a lot of uh, uh, experience, and you had quite an outstanding war record. Uh, I also know that uh, before you went to the service that... Uh, you had uh, embarked uh, and prepared yourself, embarked on and prepared yourself for uh, a career that would have been a little different than farming. Uh, uh, what, did you, what did you plan to do, Lloyd? Only I went to college at uh, Kansas University, at Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas. My plans were to be a doctor, and I was working very diligently toward that. Uh, one reason why I decided to be a doctor was the fact that I could remember the early 30s where farmers had a real rough time price-wise as well as drought. My home at that time was in Kansas, up uh, north of St. Mary's, Kansas, northwest uh, of Topeka, about 28 miles. And we experienced that extreme drought, low prices and such, and I thought then without stability in agriculture, that certainly we should get into something more stable, and I figured the doctrine profession would be that. Well, of course, Lloyd, as I know, <laughs> that you were doing more than just thinking about it because uh, you had passed the tests uh, and you had been admitted to medical uh, uh, school, as I understand it. Isn't that right? That's right. I got the admission after I had uh, got into the service. I'd already passed my aptitude tests and such before the doctors at KU. Uh, university there at uh, Kansas City, the medical school, but uh, basically what was my great problem was that I, my age was against me and Uncle Sam wanted me in the service. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, during those years it was uh, certainly the time that uh, men our age, uh, all of us had to take time uh, in the service in the defense of our country and of course I know that uh, most of the people in the NFO, including myself, spent time in the service during World War II. And uh, we, as we were doing our part in the defense of the, the liberties and the freedoms of our country and, and free enterprise, uh, I know that we take just as seriously now the freedom of uh, the type of an agriculture that we have and family uh, type agriculture. And of course, when you came back from the service, that desire to be back on the farm, and as you've told me many times, is possibly the biggest mistake you made, uh, when you decided uh, that instead of returning, which you could have done to, because you had already been admitted, 
and that you decided that instead of going on and being a doctor, you would come back and farm. Uh, yes, that's right. My father had a 323-acre uh, operation there, and, of course, I also, about that time, was thinking about getting married, and it was kind of unheard tell of at that time to be married and go through medical school, and so I uh, decided to go back to the farm, which I always had a desire to operate a farm, but uh, as I say, without the stability, uh, back in the 30s, because I guess I kind of forgot about that only while I was in the service and kind of wanted to get back to the farm again. Well, Lloyd, uh, mm. I think we should get down uh, uh, to the, so the listening audience knows the part that you have played. Uh, it's been a very significant part because, as I stated uh, before, farmers must organize uh, before they can bargain collectively. It took a dynamic leader, the head of the organizational department, which you have been, and you've headed the organizational department for many, many years. Uh, I know that you uh, were at the first meeting when the collective bargaining membership agreement was signed uh, and where a handful of farmers uh, and no one but farmers were there, uh, decided to start on a collective bargaining program and shortly after that you became uh, organizational director and you've seen the organization start uh, with a handful of farmers and build in uh, to the most powerful, uh, many times, the power of bargaining that has ever been established before in agriculture. Uh, Lloyd, tell us a little about that growth. Orly, the first winners of our organizing period, it's very hard to get farmers to leave the farm to organize. And, of course, uh, we also desired to have all farmers as organizers because the fact we felt like their heart was in it and that they would follow through with the determination needed in order to effectuate bargaining here in agriculture. And of course, uh, year after year, we worked uh, our plan, uh, continuing to expand our organization county by county as we went along, adding to our staff as we uh, progressed and as we could get more farmers to realize that they had to get in and do their bit in order to uh, get this job done and to get it done in time. And so, as we progressed on, why now then we've moved over into 25 states, which I have a map here that I'd like to point out to you just a little as to where we are organizing at this time. We start from the Canadian line here and come clear on down here into Oklahoma, on over here, clear down to the Alabama line. Then we jump over into Georgia and down into Florida. Then we start over here in the New York area come across New York, clear on over across to all this Midwest states here, county by county. We don't leave out any counties as we uh, organize. And now then we also are over here into the Magic Valley of Idaho. We have a little area in here that's skipped in here. But basically, we're out here in this great bread basket here of the United States here where the uh, food is produced. Now, we're content to expand our uh, organizing efforts as we go along, county by county state by state, and we anticipate opening more states as time goes on. We've had many requests to come into other states, but uh, we want to be sure that we do a good job in the area that we're in, concentrating there, building that production. Basically, the 75% of the hog production is in within the Midwest here in the 10 states, about 75% of the soybeans and about five of them there, and most of the fed cattle within that area. And basically, the agricultural production is there that we need to get together to bargain together and to act as one here in our bargaining efforts, where you all know when you've got your concentration of bargaining power together greater than that of the buyers, well, then you can do something with your production. Well, Lloyd, that point you brought out is so significant because when you talk about this great area that is covered by the NFO, the 25-state area that we're organized in, it means that some of the companies that buy products from farmers uh, cover that large an area also. So it means that unless you also have farmers that are joined together for the purpose of bargaining together and selling together over that same area, that you cannot be effective in bargaining unless you do cover that area and unless they're all under the same bargaining effort. So a member that has joined as a farmer in Pennsylvania or New York uh, has added his uh, bargaining power to the farmer in Iowa or Illinois that joined. Uh, in other words, their production is all brought together under the NFO collective bargaining program as the same as the farmer in North Dakota or in Florida 
or in Wisconsin or Minnesota. So this means that all of them have brought their bargaining power together, and this is so significant. But Lloyd, in order to do this, in order for them to be able to bargain together, they had to have a structure, didn't they? And uh, in order for them to have a structure, they had to all join the same organization. And in order to be effective in bargaining, uh, you had to have some things that were spelled out to the members so they would know their rights at the same time, uh, uh, give enough strength to the overall organization and protect their rights at the same time, but to give enough strength to the overall organization so that this bargaining could be done on a, in an effective basis. And so this production could be bargained for together. Uh, so what was, uh, what have the farmers that have joined the NFO, what has been their first step, Lloyd? Well, their first step only, of course, is to organize, but they must organize under a legal structure. <clears throat> and that legal structure must come under the Capra Volstead Act, given us the exemption here from the Clayton Act and Sherman Antitrust Act. And that was the membership agreement that we uh, here in the NFO have drawn up and uh, each and every member signs this membership agreement, joining his production together with his, with his other farmer friends out here in the area so that we can bargain as one. Now, this membership agreement is very simple. It really has three basic uh, points in it. One that, uh, number one is, and that's the authorization, where each and every farmer authorizes the NFO to be his bargaining agent for all commodities that he produces on his farm. Now, the reason for this is all your commodities, because if we were working this with one commodity, we would raise the price of just one commodity alone, then certainly they would get out of balance in production. So we expect to raise all the prices in a general level together here as time goes on. And number two, number two, that uh, he's free to, uh, to sell as he chooses, until such time as a contract is consummated with the processor. Now, certainly we would like very well, and it's to his advantage, in order to market with us in our marketing uh, programs here, uh, whichever it may be, whether it's in uh, dairy, grain, or meat. But uh, certainly he's free to do as he chooses uh, until such time as this contract is consummated with the processor. Now, the third, uh, third point is this. It's a three-year agreement, and he's uh, bound to buy or to pay $25 a year for each of the three years um, that the agreement is uh, uh, written for. And after we had consummated a co contract with the processor, then the 1% takes over, and he no longer pays the $25 a year, dues and fees. And the 1%, even though it's only a small part of his uh, production that was under uh, master contract and consummated with a processor, then that would pay his dues and fees at that time. Lloyd, those points you have brought out are so important because there has been many times a misunderstanding of our membership agreement. Uh, first, uh, somebody said, well, $25 a year, that's a, a big fee. Well, of course, uh, this is a small uh, amount of money to try to protect and is now successfully protecting the investment that farmers have. And then the 1% is, will be the smallest marketing charge that they have ever paid. But the fine thing about it, and the important thing about it, ladies and gentlemen, is that really the members of this organization control the organization because, as Lloyd stated, that they are free to market as they choose until such time as a contract is consummated with a processor. The only way that contracts can be consummated with processor or processors is by a two-thirds vote approval of the members affected, attending meetings of which they've been given a 10-day written notice giving date, time, place, and purpose of the meeting. In other words, the farmers that joined the NFO are really saying, we want our production to be bargained for with other farmers. We want to be able to bargain together with our neighbors and farmers over the entire agricultural area. Certainly, with this protection, and I don't see how there could be any more protection and still have an effective bargaining job than by, than by keeping the final decisions by a two-thirds vote approval of the members. Because you'll never get two-thirds of the farmers, Lloyd, in any area to vote to bind themselves to market together until they're certain of the price they're going to get, 
until they're certain where they're going to have to market, that they know all the marketing conditions under which they are to deliver their product. And so I don't see how you could have a fairer program. I don't see how you could have a program that protects the individual rights of the farmers more than this and still be effective. And so consequently, this is the reason that the NFO program has really moved out and has really progressed because farmers that sit down and understand uh, the functioning of this organization and the NFO's collective bargaining program realize that it is fair, that it is legal, and that it is effective. And I think these points are so important. Lloyd, uh, I know uh, that we all realize that the, the reason that NFO has made its progress, the reason that this spectacular progress has been made in organizing and now in bargaining has been because of the dedicated work of our members. The wor members that were willing to volunteer, spend their own money, talk to their neighbors to convince their neighbors that they should all do something about their problems. But I do know that you have also a vast organizational structure which is necessary in order to tie this volunteer work together, uh, this working of farmers together. Tell us something about your structure, Lloyd. Well, Lee, we have an organizational structure here, of course, of uh, assistant national organizational directors, which each one of them are over five counties or more, basically five counties over this entire 25 state area that we're working here. And of course, those fellows are uh, given some expenses here to uh, leave their farms, which they must leave their farms in order to go organize. They must work a full week. Some of them are gone as much as two weeks at a time and get come home only at that time with their wives and hard men and others taking care of the farming operation. Certainly, of course, there isn't enough money in Knox Treasury to organize farmers if you had to pay for it. But uh, we do have a voluntary program here that we use. It's a saturation membership uh, drive that we've uh, been operating this winter. And we expect to contact uh, over a million and a half farmers with this program, only, and that's a voluntary program. And I'd say that the farmers today, members, non-members alike today, see the necessity of a program like this and their enthusiasm and determination in order to make this program work is the highest that I've seen it now for several years. Yes, Lloyd, there's no question but what that the image of the NFO has greatly improved. And I would say that the image has improved only because there is a better understanding, a better understanding of what we set out to do, a better understanding of our accomplishments, and now a realization that we have the experience in the NFO in bargaining with the nation's largest processors of dairy, grain, and meat. And I mean the major processors and handlers in each of these commodities. People now realize that this experience is beginning to pay off. It's having its effect. But it has always been amazing to me, really, why farmers have to get interested first, then study uh, the collective bargaining program. This I'm, this I'm sure that everyone realizes is necessary and is as it should be. But the part that has always amazed me is, why is it that uh, NFO members have to go out and convince their neighbors that they should also be interested in doing something about the pricing of our product. It seems to me, at least now, Lloyd, that many of the non-members should come to the NFO members and ask them what, what is being done. I don't believe that members now should have to go out as they have in the past and talk to the non-members because it's evident that we are making great progress and it's a progress that is benefiting all farmers. Of course, we're always trying to do a little better job for our members through our bargaining efforts, but we're also having an effect on the general price level. This has always, uh, to me, uh, seemed to be a lack of interest on the part of so many farmers and their own welfare, but uh, we're proud of the progress we've made because of so many farmers that have been willing to go out and talk to their neighbor. Apparently, we are finding that uh, many of the non-members are coming to our members and asking to join. I'm getting reports of this at various places in the counties. They're 
Others have asked, uh, why haven't you come to see me sooner? Some of them are coming to our collection points on our meet and asking to join and such. And the general attitude uh, is much better in that respect. And I think that uh, they already see, many of the non-members already see the progress NFO has made. There's no uh, mistaken about the fact that we have raised the uh, general price of a lot of commodities. And uh, they're giving us uh, a credit for that. And they want to join an organization without trying to do something for the farmers. Well, I think this is right, Lloyd, and there's been so much misunderstanding, so many rumors that have been spread about NFO. And, of course, we expected this in the beginning because we knew that we were going to be uh, doing things that in marketing that had never been done, that many people had been living off of the farmers, uh, and that these people would fight very hard, and they have. But now the image of the NFO, the true image, is coming through. And I think that I should point out uh, here, in conclusion, uh, to remind uh, the farmers the real success that we are having in bargaining on in uh, dairy, grain, and meat. Uh, because I hear it said uh, many times, well, uh, uh, what has NFO really done? Uh, I think this is obvious now, as our members are uh, selling their livestock uh, in new marketing patterns, and non-members see that our members are going to different uh, points to deliver their products. Uh, this means cattle and hogs. And they know that most of the time our members are netting more dollars. But they also have been wondering what has really happened to the hog price, for example. And I have here with me here, and I thought this was uh, something that I should do, is go back and look uh, what people were saying uh, last February and March about the market for hogs during the next 12 months. And I went back to the Iowa Farm Letter, which was the Iowa is the Outlook Letter, and it uh, comes from the Cooperative Extension Service, the Iowa State University. There's many letters that are published like this. And uh, this was an uh, April 2nd issue, and the March 31st issue uh, had about the same thing to say, that there would be an expected reduction of uh, eight, nine percent in hogs, but they also predicted the price. And that price was going to be a $19 average top in August uh, in the state of Iowa for hogs, and they was going to follow with a $16.5 a hundred weight price in November. So there had to be new marketing factors. These new marketing factors simply were that the NFO members were taking a large volume of production under meat marketing arrangements out of many areas. The remaining buyers, had to compete vigorously, brought new competition into buying. We are now doing the same thing on grain. We're moving on dairy and a marketing agency and common structure that we have recommended is being set up. This means where dairy farmers will have the opportunity to see their production bargain for nationwide. Farmers may have disagreed with our methods, our strategy in the past but they can't disagree with our new and additional methods of bargaining together and marketing together. Anything short of fair farm prices brings about dangerous, excessive debt expansion that mortgages the future of our nation. The members of the National Farmers Organization are calling on the rest of the American farmers to join with them in an all-out effort to correct this underpayment to agriculture and help build a stronger America. Remember, farmers who know, join the NFO. Until next week at this same time, thank you for watching.